bored already. Yeah. He's you like, won't. I hate philosophy. So, you ready? We're going to do legal positivism. Legal positivism. You know all about that, right? What do you think of legal positivism? No? Yeah. You, you like it all right? Okay. He's a... Uh, this is this is Echo. Echo uh, understands all the things we're going to talk about. Um, but he's not going to comment. And uh, there's even a chance he might leave during this video because, you know, he already knows all this stuff and he's bored. Let's see. Okay. So today we're going to do... Uh, brief introduction to the co basic concepts that are connected to legal positivism. We've been covering uh, natural law theory for the last couple of weeks and something that I notice with students very often is that I, because we start in this class with natural law theory, a lot of people uh, start to treat natural law theory like all of philosophy of law basically comes down to the principles of natural law, which some natural law theorists would be delighted if you uh, came up with that conclusion, but unfortunately, it ain't the case. Uh, so today we're going to talk about positive law uh, as the basis for um, legal thinking and legal theory. What is the difference between natural law and positive law? Well, think of it in these sorts of terms. Natural law is something that we have to figure out based on our observation of the world and the way things work. Uh, we use our reason to determine implicit principles, which we then apply to come up with human laws that are thought to be binding because of the moral weight of the natural law that's behind them. Natural law itself is only really binding morally and thus only really enforceable by social pressure rather than much else. On the other hand, uh, a positive law is a law that is expressly declared by someone. So it's clear, it's human, and it's explicit. You don't have to find it implicitly somewhere. You don't have to try to figure out what it is. And because of that, it has legal force rather than moral force. It may also have moral force. We have to discuss that. But it has legal force rather than moral force. Of course, you don't have to use reason to figure out what it is. You can very often just read it on a page. Um, it's legally binding and legally enforced. Moral law, uh, natural law, is implicitly discovered, socially enforced, and only becomes legally enforced once it is turned into a positive variant, uh, which can then be legally enforced. So HLA Hart... Uh, who's one of the most important legal theorists of the 20th century, and uh, really, so far, one of the most important of the 21st century, although he died before uh, the turn of the century. Um, he has provided us with a very good basic idea of five key views that are held by um, legal positivists in general. And I, I want to connect these uh, to uh, some of the theses that we talked about in class. There were the the three main theses, and I'm going to add a fourth. Um, first of all, the first principle is that laws are essentially human commands. They don't come from God. They don't come from the natural world or anything like that. They come from human beings who've determined that this is the way we ought to operate. So laws have human origins, not divine or origins and not origins in the structure of the universe. Um, <clears throat> That leads us to the second point, which is actually something that we've already discussed as the separability thesis, which is that there is no necessary connection between law and morality. And if you, um, if you want to include moral considerations in laws, you, you can't do it as a matter of necessity. It's going to be for some other reason. Third, the analysis of legal concepts needs to be considered as being different from the analysis that you would do in a social science context or a historical context. You're going to do the, the analysis of legal contexts, the legal concepts in a legal context. You can see why I got mixed up there. That's the third one. So you're not, so the study of law is its own thing. It's separate from the study of history. 
It's separate from the study of social science. It's not the study of morality. Laws are not moral things. Laws are, well, legal things, uh, and so on. So that's the next thing. Finally, or not finally, fourth, legal systems are closed. This is implied by the third one. Legal systems are closed in the sense that correct decisions in a legal context do not require additional outside considerations. That is to say, considerations that come from outside the legal context. So I don't need, for example, moral considerations to be applied from outside the legal context in which I find myself and then use those in a, uh, in a legal context. Instead, I'm going to use legal considerations in a legal context, the moral considerations in a moral context. Now, that doesn't mean that the fact that people have certain beliefs about morality is going to be irrelevant. And it doesn't mean that, um, for example, the fact that certain things have been done historically is irrelevant. The difference is that I don't need to place law within a historical context. I don't need to place it within a social science or a moral context. I'm simply going to use law as law, and I'm going to consider legal concepts. And certain historical, social science, or moral concepts might become legal concepts and become relevant, but if not, I don't have to bring them in. <clears throat> Finally, moral judgments, moral judgments are not of a type that you can establish as true or false using rational arguments. In other words, legal positivism tends to assume uh, moral non-cognitivism. We talked about non-cognitivism in a previous video, and we've talked about it in class a little bit. This is the idea that moral ideas, moral statements, cannot be said to be either true or false. They're a different kind of statement from that. So, for a legal positivist, you cannot establish the truth of a moral concept using rational means. You have to use some other means. And, and it may not be that you can actually determine that these statements are either true or false. Now, uh, how is that relevant to a legal situation? Well, as you know, we have the nothing wrong. Now, it's worth noting here that just because um, positivists tend to be non-cognitivists and because they tend to support the separability thesis, that does not imply that they think that morality and ethics are irrelevant. I've been hinting at this. Uh, most of the legal thinkers that we look at in classes like this, so for example, Bentham, John Austin, um, H.L.A. Hart, Joseph Raz, Hans Kelsen, those are the five that we have in mind. Um, these, these five theorists are all interested in uh, legal reform. They all want to fix problems of injustice that exist in legal contexts and in, in legal um, structures. The thing is, if you want to fix a legal, a legal problem that leads to injustice, then insofar as you're talking about injustice, you are using a moral concept and you are talking about morality. The difference is this. Ju and I'm, I'm going to use an, an illustration that I got from Raymond Wax, who wrote your textbook. Um, he wrote this in a different book. But um, his, his example is this. If I want to explain to you or understand with you how a car engine works, I'm not going to start by criticizing the placement of the, of the carburetor, or by saying that uh, spark plugs are passe, or by talking about uh, how we should really be moving on to electric cars or hydrogen-powered cars or something like that. I'm not going to start by cri criticizing the way things are working. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to correctly describe the way an engine works. And only once I've correctly described the way the engine works, can I then make recommendations for fixing the engine and making it work better. And I can only make those recommendations if I do it in the context of mechanics, of engine mechanics. I cannot bring in something from some other field and call that relevant and say, well, you know, because of this thing that 
um, they do in biology, we should really be thinking about changing the structure of the internal combustion engine. That doesn't work. What I need to do is I need to fully understand the internal combustion engine and then based on that, I need to make recommendations for change. Similarly, I need to fully understand the, the way in which law works, what a law is, how laws work, how they're enforced, what kinds of things they imply and don't apply, uh, when we should have laws, when we shouldn't have laws, when we do have laws, when we don't have laws, all that sort of thing, the nature of the sovereign, the relationship between the sovereign and the subject, all the various kinds of things that we're talking about, what kinds of rights do people have, uh, what kinds of rights do we not recognize, um, and so on. And once I fully understand the way in which the legal structure works and the kinds of things that you can do with the law, only then can I begin to make recommendations for changing the law in ways that might make it work better. And then I can identify injustice in legal terms, and I can say the injustice is unacceptable for these legal reasons, and we can improve the situation if we make these legal changes. So I don't need to use morality at all in that kind of a process, although I can. So while they're not, uh, they're not interested in making morality one of the basic elements of a legal theory, they also don't necessarily think that it's completely out of line to periodically appeal to moral concepts in certain contexts. That's going to depend on the theorist. For example, H.L.A. Hart is going to be quite open to that kind of thing. Hans Kelsen is not going to be very open to that kind of thing at all. So that's, um, that's something that is important to notice. Now, each one of these theorists has a different notion of what a law actually is. So, if you think of it this way, according to Bentham, Jeremy Bentham is, well, in many ways, he's the first modern legal or uh, positivist. So, the first modern legal positivist was Jeremy Bentham, who is a very, very subtle and interesting thinker. And I'm going to massacre his thought right now. I'm going to do the same thing with a couple of others, but I'm going to do it with his in particular. And I'm paraphrasing uh, a description of his that I get from a combination of uh, Raymond Wack's book, Understanding Jurisprudence, and uh, Free Michael Freeman's book, um, uh, Lloyd's Introduction to Jurisprudence. Um, and um, so I'm, I've taken these two accounts of Bentham's work and I've mashed them together into this summary statement of what he thinks. And I recognize that this is not adequate, but it'll do the job for us, for our purposes. So what is a law? Or what is law? Law is a collection of explicit commands. So a law must be an explicit command. Expressing the will of the sovereign. Intended to shape people's behavior by giving them a motive for obeying commands. For obeying the commands we're talking about, the commands of the, of the sovereign. And that motive, of course, is going to be some kind of sanction, um, uh, very often a coercive sanction. It'll be, and it's one that will be applied by legal authorities. So that's, that's Bentham. And I want you to think about that one, and we're going to compare that definition of law to the definition of John Austin, whose work is derivative of Bentham's work, according to the sources I've been studying. Austin says... A law is a command of a politically superior sovereign issued to a politically inferior subject. The sovereign must be clearly determined and identifiable, and the command must be accompanied by a sanction uh, and therefore enforceable or, in fact, enforced. If it doesn't have one of the three characteristics, if it isn't a command, an explicit command, if if there isn't an identifiable sovereign, and if there is no sanction attached, it's not a law. So that's going to be Austin and Bentham. Now notice that both Austin and Bentham are focused on power relations between the um, sovereign and the subject, and that both Austin and Bentham think that the, these commands, they identify laws as commands, and they think that these commands 
emanate from politically superior sovereigns and uh, to the politically inferior subjects, and also that they must be enforceable and actually enforced, and that that enforcement is going to be carried out by um, political uh, means, political legal means. In other words, the police, the courts, and so on. Right? Whatever uh, mechanisms are approved by the uh, society in which you live. So sanction matter. The sanctions also matter in that case. Uh, this has raised a lot of criticism because, uh, first of all, you can identify a lot of kinds of laws that don't involve sanctions. Secondly, there are all kinds of laws or areas that we understand to be laws which are um, not uh, covered by these definitions. For example, international law, constitutional law, contract law. There's a real question about whether any of these would be considered to be law by by this definition. And in fact, Bentham and Austin pretty much agree that these things are law by analogy, international law, constitutional law, contract law. It's law by analogy with positive law, but it's not actually positive law. It's something else that's going on there. Why? Well, there's no command by a sovereign or there's no ability to, to, to perform a sanction. You know, if you say, uh, in order to be married or divorced, this is the, what you have to do legally. Well, that's not going to involve a sanction and therefore it's going to be not really law. It's going to be analogous to law. It's going to be something like a law. So, um, and then they have terminology for this that I'm going to uh, ignore for the moment. So, that's what's going on with um, Bentham and with Austin. And Bentham and Austin are really the founders of legal positivism in the English-speaking world anyway, um, in the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, we have two or three very, very important theorists. We have Hans Kelsen in Germany, we have H.L.A. Hart in the United States, and we have um, Joseph Raz, who is, from, uh, is actually an Oxford professor, so he's in, uh, in England. Um, this um, 20th and 21st century positivism is connected to three theses that we've already identified in class. So you have the separability thesis, which we've already mentioned. You have the pedigree thesis, which is, or sometimes called the conventionality thesis, and you have the social fact thesis, and we've talked about these already. To these three, I want to now add something that comes up uh, primarily in the context of H.L.A. Hart, and which will be very important when we begin to discuss the theory of Ronald Dworkin. Um, and that is something we're going to call the discretion thesis. Now, the discretion thesis is about what judges do when they're faced with hard cases. So a judge is faced with a difficult case, doesn't know how to respond to it. Uh, maybe there's no clear constitutional law. Maybe it's not actually obvious what the law uh, should say at this time, what the law actually does say at this point. Uh, we've been talking about, we've been talking about um, positivism and positive law, but many positive laws are judge-made in the sense that the judge will recognize that you have an enforceable duty to perform this or that task, uh, and that will get recognized by a court. And then once the judge recognizes it, it, it becomes recognized as part of law. So, um, so the discretion thesis is going to say when a judge doesn't have a clear law from the sovereign upon which to depend in making his or her ruling, then the judge uh, must make new law. And so the judge will, in fact, create a law based upon uh, a set of principles or uh, legal principles, of course, or based upon a set of legal precedents that point in a particular direction. But this is very much based on the judgment, the good judgment, and the wisdom of the judge. And so um, new laws get made by judges is the idea here um, when that's necessary. Dworkin is going to have a problem with this. We'll talk about that when the time comes. And with that, I'm going to stop with this brief introduction 
to uh, natural law theory. I haven't talked about Joseph Raz at all. Hopefully I will. Um, and I hope this has been helpful to you. And I will see you in class.